Jesus. Good morning to everyone. We are we are getting started. Is, are you hearing me? Yes. Is this working? Uh, so we are getting started in two minutes just to check that our remote panelists are connected and can uh, communicate with us. Uh, is there anyone from technical assistance here that can check whether they are connected or not? Nope. Okay. I'm, let me check by email. <laughs>
Good morning to everyone. So we have a, we will have a, a little reschedule of our uh, agenda of our workshop agenda as uh, we are trying to figure out if the remote panelists are connected or not. Uh, so we will have uh, as uh, speakers. Good morning to everyone. My name is Luca Belli. First of all, I'm a professor of internal governance and regulation at FGV in Rio de Janeiro. Uh, I will have uh, today with me Nicholas Bramble from Google. Uh, I'm just quickly introducing yourself if you want to say more about what are your specific tasks and what is your organization doing in uh, the field of smart cities. Well, besides your presentation, feel free to, to say it. Then there is Jessica Reyes, who is a researcher at FGV, uh, one of my colleagues. Uh, Olga Cavalli, who, who is the, the, the founder of the uh, South School on Internet Governance, amongst uh, many other uh, things. Uh, there is Yogi uh, Anti Poikola, called Yogi for Friends, uh, who is the, the father of, of mydata.org, uh, which is an extremely uh, interesting uh, uh, initiative. And then I would also like to thank Raoul Plomer, uh, who is our uh, remote moderator, and Luafa Gusto, who is our rapporteur. We also have in, uh, online. Uh, we should have online uh, as soon as we figure out how to connect uh, Robert Matthews, who is uh, from the University of Hawaii, actually, but he spent 37 years as a senior uh, official from the U.S. government, leading with uh, interconnection of systems and uh, and. Uh, uh, critical uh, in infrastructure, and also Jean Philbert uh, and Singimana, who is was previously uh, the uh, cabinet minister for ICT of Rwanda, and now serves as senior advisor of Smart Africa. Uh, let me. I see that Robert Matthews has just replied to my email to tell me if, whether he is online or not. Uh, he can hear me, but. Uh, Okay, uh, we can, can we open the voice connection to see if Robert can can speak? We have we have Robert. Robert, can you hear us? Is it open the, the voice connection? So, Robert, if you can hear us. Who? They, you, uh, we cannot hear you, but you, they, are they speaking? I cannot see them. His mic is muted, apparently. Okay, so perhaps Robert, you should appear in the speaking queue to start. Let's do, let's uh, uh, do like that. Let's maybe uh, reschedule Robert right after Nicholas. And let's start with Nicholas that uh, is already physically here and can tell us uh, what is uh, Google vision with regard to smart cities. Uh, we know that you are investing a lot, so you have uh, one of your branches, uh, Sidewalks Lab, is, uh, is building an entire uh, block in Toronto. Uh, so uh, while we figure out how to have a, 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 a smooth connection with Robert, uh, please, uh, Nicholas, go ahead. Uh, you can introduce yourself and tell us a little, a little more. Sure. Uh, thank you, Luca. I'm, I'm honored to be here today. I feel strange opening the panel because almost everyone in this, in this room is probably more of an expert on smart cities than I am. So I'll try to talk relatively briefly um, about some of our projects, some of our interests in smart cities, and then hopefully have more of a detailed discussion uh, during uh, Q&A. Uh, obviously, a, a growing population in the world lives uh, in urban areas. It was about 50% back in 2007, and I think that the uh, UN predicted this figure would grow to over 70% uh, by 2050. Cities are facing a series of intensifying struggles from the high cost of living to congested commutes to environmental issues and public health issues. And there's an opportunity now to use connective tools to take on these challenges 
and accelerate the process of, of urban innovation. I, I grew up in a very small town about an hour from New York City, and I never went to New York City growing up, which is a strange uh, just sort of reflection of how distant cities often seem from people, I think, sometimes. Uh, until, until I turned 17, I, I didn't make the journey, in part because there wasn't any public transit to get there, um, and, and the city itself was um, just difficult to, to navigate for, for a young person. Um, but so I'll, I'll try to talk about some of the opportunities of smart cities first, and then address some of the potential pitfalls that come up um, when you're thinking about, about these issues. So technology is, is in many ways changing the relationship of citizens to public services. You know, there's a lot of examples out there. There are garbage cans that can alert you when they're full, um, streets that tell you when snow plows are most needed. Um, there are ways to, to map air quality uh, levels to asthma attacks and to sort of target uh, public health interventions based upon that kind of data. There, there are ways to, to map lead levels in cities. This is a, a big issue in, in the United States where there's a, a, a clear linkage between the presence of lead and developmental de delays and disabilities mm -hmm. um, among, among the youth in America. So uh, we're very interested in trying to figure out how do you better map lead levels and predict the, the, the presence of lead in, in a place. One example of where we've done some work here is in Flint, Michigan, um, where we partnered with the University of Michigan and Georgia Tech and a few other universities uh, who developed uh, an AI-driven tool to, to understand when uh, lead pipes, did, where they were and, and how to replace them uh, most efficiently. And the way, the way this worked, by the way, is really interesting, I think. You know, we, we took a lot of very old, and this, was, this wasn't us, this was uh, mostly Georgia Tech researchers, who took a, a, a large number of old city plans and digitized them, including over 140,000 handwritten building records, and then analyzed all this information to figure out, um, you know, what the factors are that are likely to predict the prevalence of, of, lead, of lead pipes. So things like the, the, the age of a home, the location of a home, the value of a home, uh, all this um, added up to an algorithm that let, that let these researchers target um, homes that are likely to have lead pipes with a, about a 97% success rate. And before doing this intervention, um, there was a, an effort to, to do some remediation in, in Flint, and about 20% of the houses that were, that were uh, targeted actually did not have lead pipes in them. So it ended up being kind of a, a cost constraint on local government to address the issue. So by having these kinds of interventions, you can hopefully improve the efficiency of, the, of those uh, abatement efforts and, and you know, save a lot of money, but also um, target your health interventions much, much more effectively. Um, obviously, there's, there's a lot to do on, with smart cities on decreasing carbon emissions. So in London, for example, existing buildings account for about 80% of the city's carbon emissions. And there's a lot of work to be done there, I think, in trying to figure out how do you um, build more energy efficient uh, um, housing and transport solutions, and how do you be better capture uh, th these potential emissions. There's a tool that, that we've, we've been working on that's designed to sort of just promote smart installation of housing. So rather than letting all the heat that, that, that naturally occurs within the house, whether it's from your computer or from the shower or from other, other areas, you know, leak out of the house, you can better preserve that within the house and, and basically save on heating bills uh, in, in the process. There are a lot of examples of, of, of smart cities, you know, in the U.S. and elsewhere. I, I think India has committed to building 100 smart cities. At the end of 2017, the Indonesian government um, quadrupled the budget for its own smart city program um, and has hired a team of programmers to de develop hundreds of new apps that can enable citizens to report broken road conditions uh, or respond to public concerns uh, uh, through um, Twitter or, or other, other apps that are out there. I think one interesting sort of um, uh, issue to highlight here is that there's the issue of sort of data deserts that comes up here. There's an example in Boston, Massachusetts, where the city released uh, an app called uh, Street Bump. And that, the purpose of this, of this app was to um, have the ability to detect in real time where there are potholes on, on the roads of Boston and to, and to fix those potholes uh, quickly. Um, but of course, to have this app, you needed to have connectivity, you needed to have a phone, you also needed to have a car. So it, it turned out that the interventions being triggered by this example were targeted towards wealthy neighborhoods, and very few were happening in neighborhoods where there was not sufficient connectivity or, and there was not sufficient sort of um, usage of, of, of the app. So uh, I think it's important to, to recognize that just throwing the te technology out there and hoping the solutions will emerge by virtue of the technology is no longer a realistic way to think about smart cities. You actually have to do uh, very detailed an analysis and uh, solicit participation from the community that you're trying to, to, to target and really understand like where, where the sort of fault lines are within a city and try to understand exactly where an intervention might be useful for one um, part of the city but not for another and, and how do you sort of democratize access to that, that app. Um, 
And I'll say a little bit, um, so I, I do not work on, on sidewalk labs, and I'm not an expert on this issue. There's a whole separate team outside of Google, actually, that's now working on, on this issue. Um, but I'll, I'll say a few quick words about it, just to, because I think it's an interesting topic. You know, I, I, I think the really interesting thing emerging in sidewalk is on the issue of data governance and, and, and on privacy. So the sidewalk submitted a, a set of plans uh, to, to the um, province of Ontario uh, last month that were designed to sort of reflect very detailed uh, engagement from the community on, on what their concerns were about the usage of data um, within the city, city environment. And the conclusion, I think, which uh, was um, reflected not just in, in our own sort of filing, but also uh, in, in comments from the uh, Ontario Privacy Commissioner, was that the interesting way to think about data is, is as sort of like a um, an enab enabling tool to build to build things on top on for, for anybody who wants to build uh, within a city. And so you can think of sort of the urban technology stack, sort of like the internet protocol stack, where on the internet, you know, you can use any browser uh, to navigate to any web page and that's being run by any type of web server. Similarly, in, in the urban environment, we think that you should be able to sort of build any application uh, on any data sharing portal or any sort of measurement tool that is generated by uh, any form of connectivity that is tied to the physical environment. So if there are smart traffic lights or if there are smart uh, other, other installations in the city, we don't want to have exclusive access to that data. We want to make sure that that data is open and can be reused uh, by any, any developer that's certified by the city um, and by an independent uh, trust to, to work on that data. And, and we've also thought carefully about what kind of privacy impact assessments need to be submitted uh, not just by us, but by any developer that wants to use this kind of data within, within the city environment. And I've worked closely with, with uh, the city of Toronto to figure out exactly how to uh, structure that, that relationship. There's some parallel examples out there. In, in Barcelona, um, there's sort of a trusted intermediary in, in data commons model. And Barcelona has a, actually a city operating system that is the city's, sort of city's internal data, data trust managed by the city's chief data officer. And in this model, all, all of the city's data is pulled into one central repository, sort of a commons, and then managed by a trusted intermediary. We think that's a really interesting example of how you can make data publicly available, but not make it exclusive, and ensure that anybody who wants to use this data to build interesting new services within a city has the, has the capability to do so. In Estonia, there's this API, API framework management um, um, that uh, is called Estonia's X-Road Data Exchange Platform. This is based on a similar approach where each collector of data stores its own data, but then that is all standardized and accessed uh, through an API that's managed by the trust. So even, uh, even as you're collecting data, you're feeding it back into a central repository that others can use uh, to build upon that data. And the idea is to, you know, to build a sort of a, a similar sort of structure to the, a the app development ecosystem, where you have an API model that allows developers and others to access data for testing and product development and, and data analytics. Um, so that, you know, those are a few examples, I think, of what's, what's, what's happening out there in the smart cities world. But again, I think many of you will have more expertise in this area than I do, so I'm, I'm very happy to turn it over and then talk about this stuff more in, in the Q&A. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, very, thank you very much, Nicholas. And actually, it's very good to see that uh, Google's vision is also about trying to share the data that are collected, not make it something exclusive and uh, trying to make it as open as possible. And actually the fact that you consider also some the, the example of Barcelona as a, a, a good practice is uh, something re very reassuring because actually in our findings of our project also, we consider Barcelona as probably the best practice possible. So uh, I think it, that gives us a good segue to uh, uh, keep on with Jessica while uh, we figure out uh, to the, the remote connection. Uh, as I know that both Robert and Phil can hear me, I would suggest them to use the speaking queue device, the function that you use, that you find on the website, so that then you can, uh, we are sure that you can uh, talk while you, we prepare your uh, PowerPoint presentation, that I think would be better to have in the second segment of the, of the uh, workshop, not to disrupt it. So, uh, Jessica, please go ahead. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for being here with us today. Uh, I'm going to briefly speak about the right to the smart city, uh, if we can say so. Uh, and it's based in a research we've been developing at, at FGV. Luca and I are coordinators of this research that is funded by the Open Society Foundations. And it's called Discrimination in Data Control in Brazilian Smart Cities. Uh, we've been looking to, uh, to We've, be, we've been trying to map data governance and good practice, as well as like, trying to map the whole ecosystem around smart cities in Brazil. 
and it kind of reflects uh, an international scenario. So uh, I have a few thoughts to share with you today, and I've been following these discussions in other United Nations forum, like the World Urban Forum and the Habitat Tree two years ago. And also I've been doing like field work in the expos and forums and exhibitions, all kinds of conference on smart cities happening in Brazil this year. So it's been like endless hours following and doing participant observation and trying to have like this uh, ethnographic approach as well so we can like be there, uh, see who are speaking about smart cities, who are, uh, which initiatives and policies should uh, be studied and like trying to listen to people and doing interviews with uh, all the stakeholders we can reach. Uh, and also, well, uh, what I have to say basically is uh, as you may know, we have like a new urban agenda that will set the guidelines for urban planning and urban policy over the next 20 years. And we have IGF here as a United Nations for us as well. Uh, and we need to like keep, we need to like share the agendas and uh, cooperate more in regards to smart cities and privacy concerns because like I, I haven't seen much of these discussions on smart cities here and we have a lot to talk about and we have a lot to catch up in terms of smart cities initiatives here and we also need to like cooperate with the urban policy agenda in discusses what are the challenges that this smart city agenda might face over the next years and well, for the first time, the right to the city became uh, part of the new urban agenda as well as the smart city was incorporated and it was also an issue paper that it's worth reading. So for the first time, this term is brought to, into the new urban agenda and it's going to be discussed and implemented a lot over the next years. So, and as we know, smart cities initiatives are already a reality in many, many cities around the world. And of course, they pose many challenges, and like privacy and cybersecurity and data governance uh, concerns. Luca is going to speak a little bit about the, about the data governance we are looking into. And we also have been uh, wondering what are the costs of efficiency, because usually we see a discourse that uh, it's a binary between privacy or efficiency, like you need to make our cities more efficient, but for whom and at which cost in terms of personal data and uh, privacy for its citizens. And uh, we also have been looking through a huge lack of social participation, like the lack of civil society engaging in these topics in these forums. Uh, partially in Brazil specifically, I'm going to speak about Brazil, that's what we are, we've been studying over this last year. Um, these forums, for example, the spaces where decision making takes place, uh, they are like quite expensive to attend these forums. You have all these meetings with VIPs that are done like in closed doors. So civil society has some issues to engage in these discussions and where the decisions are being made. Uh, and also, as I mentioned before, we really need like to uh, align our agendas on discussing everything that we discuss here needs to be taken to these forums and we need to create spaces to discuss all the, the problematic approach to da big data collection and these smart initiatives for our cities. So, uh, and it's interesting to speak after uh, Google, I think we have a lot of things to cooperate in the future and we need, we really, really need to make uh, these spaces of discussion and policy making more uh, diverse and it's uh, like I've been, <coughs> In this conference, and I've been, I, I saw like endless hours of all white male panels discuss the future of our cities, and it, they are not a very diverse environment, and like we we really we really need to participate more, and I think uh, something that I would suggest and discuss with you, I would be glad to discuss this with you more in the Q&A, like how can we be part of this process and how here at the IGF and folks working with internet governance could like cooperate more in this agenda because it's urgent and it's happening so like we need to, to be part of this uh, and we like really need advocacy and serious research about this beyond the hype of smart cities and uh, we start to see things coming through and like really good research being done but like we really need to discuss this more critically uh, and we need to make sure that smart city initiatives do not be used as mechanisms to reproduce exclusion and discrimination, something we've been dealing about in our research and all the field work and the idea of cities for all that is such a huge part of the habitat agenda for the next years. 
Uh, we really need to think if our concepts of smart learners are like inclusive, and if they take a critical take on technologies, and if they are engaging with the public interest as well. And we'd love like to share experience. We are trying to build a, an observatory of smart cities there at FTV, and we are trying like to engage all the efforts to discuss this, especially in Latin America, and how can we. Uh, participate in this debate and help to foster better smart cities which include like the right to the city in a more inclusive, balanced and uh, equitative way as well. So well, I think that's, thank you. Excellent, thank you very much Jessica to highlight that there are, uh, although there are many benefits, there are also still some challenges that have been addressed and that frequently are not uh, at least from our uh, findings, what is emerging is that frequently they are not really uh, being addressed in an uh, open uh, and uh, democratic way. I, I, would, I think we can uh, uh, have Olga still in this first segment, so that we, then we, we have uh, Yogi and uh, remote participation and myself in the second one. Uh, Olga, would you care to sure. go ahead? Thank you, Luca. Thank you for inviting me. This is a very important uh, issue especially for Latin America you know um, about 80 percent of the population in Latin America live in in urban areas in cities and we have the largest cities in the world I would say perhaps in, in the Americas by far Sao Paulo, Buenos Aires, Rio, Mexico City they are huge cities with many challenges and also um, I was I was hearing the colleague from from Google and speaking about the having connectivity and the, the Latin America is a very unequal um, region in, in terms of the distribution of infrastructure and distribution of wealth. So there are areas which are very, very rich and very well connected and areas which are not. But you would not believe that that happens also in the cities. Uh, so uh, you have very, very wealthy and well connected neighborhoods and by side you have very poor neighborhoods all together. So those gaps of connectivity that you were mentioning in cities in Latin America are present all the time. So for building a, a, a smart city in, in our South American region is quite challenging. So I, I will share with you some information that, that um, I've been gathering. Uh, if, you, um, if you check the rankings of, of smart cities in the world, you will see that Latin America is somehow lacking behind. The problems that we share in our big cities are similar. We have problems with transportation. We have problems with, um, um, how do you say basura in English? Uh, trash management. Uh, you have problems with uh, security and environment. So those uh, the cities in Latin America don't show up very high in the rankings. I, I have checked several and we are kind of low. Some cities are showing a little bit uh, higher and I will share with you what are uh, we, uh, what are these sittings doing. Um, so uh, I, 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 I focus on, on one, one uh, list of cities uh, uh, built by University of Navarra in Spain that uh, there are only five cities in the first 100 cities. Uh, so the, these top five Latin American cities are Buenos Aires, where I live, in Argentina, Santiago de Chile, Mexico, uh, this is the capital city of Mexico, uh, Medellin in Colombia, and Montevideo in Uruguay. No Brazilians, in that, but, but it's only one index. Um, uh, so you have work, <laughs> yeah, you have work to do. <laughs> um, so, the, for example, Buenos Aires is a city that I would mention some activities which are done by the present government of the city. But Buenos Aires is a city of three million people surrounded by an uh, urban area uh, that, that acts as a whole as a one city. So it's the three million plus ten million surround. It, it works, it, it operates as a simple city, one city, but, but the, the government and the jurisdiction is different from the city in the middle and the rest of the city surrounding, which brings a lot of complications, you know, in terms of how to uh, orga uh, organize and manage the resources and the activities. So um, what the city of Buenos Aires is doing right now is having big data information for making decisions in relation with different activities in the city. They have, uh, for example, trying to measure quality standards for 
for different activities, privacy regulations, the, anal the analysis of data for cleaning the city, for organ donations. They have installed 1,000 sens sensors all over the city to uh, manage the traffic, which is, traffic in Buenos Aires is not the worst that you can find in the world, but it's becoming more and more complicated. The city has established um, a lot of BC senders. How do you say BC sender in English? It's a, a way only for bicycles, but um, it's becoming complicated because um, motorcycles are using the bicycles, uh, roads, and um, so the sensors are, are trying to order the traffic ordered the, some uh, environmental information. They have installed a low range uh, wide area network for, it's the first of its kind in Latin America for managing all this information. Uh, I, I appreciate the, the intentions of the city in putting all this information uh, as open as possible so uh, researchers and, and uh, investigators can use it for, for managing the city. Uh, there is a map of free Wi-Fi. There is a map of shops available. Uh, uh, several applications for transportation, for buses, for bicycles, free bicycles in the city, and how to reach places in the city, and also several cultural agendas. You may know that Argentina, uh, Buenos Aires has a lot of, it's a city with more theaters in the world, more than New York. Um, so citizens can get all this type of information. Of course, you need connectivity and you need to have a smartphone for that, but that's, uh, that's a different workshop. Uh, and Santiago de Chile is also one of the considered more smart cities in Latin America. It's a smaller city than Buenos Aires that acts like a 12 million inhabitants. Chile has around 5 million inhabitants. Chile has a real challenge with environmental because of the geography where it's located. It's in a valley. Uh, so they have interesting projects for smart grid to manage energy generation and distribution. Uh, they are promoting electromobility within the city. And uh, they have a special training for not only the mayor of Santiago de Chile, but all the city mayors in Chile, trying to um, make them understand the value of technology in the cities. And they have a list of companies, shops, and several projects, including security cameras all over the city. And finally, I will mention that Mexico is one of the most challenging cities because it's really huge, 30 million people living in that beautiful city. So they have also systems for helping traffic control and environmental measures uh, and disaster recovery. So that's uh, my comment for the moment, and maybe we can add other uh, comments later. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So uh, while we uh, f figure out the last details of the remote participation, I would like to open uh, briefly the floor after this first segment uh, for a couple of comments, questions. I'm pretty sure there are people in the room that are maybe already working on this or maybe want to share uh, some experience. So if anyone wants at this point to uh, to provide any input or feedback or ask any question. Uh, may, this could be a, a mo good moment to, uh, to ask question or provide, or provide feedback. So uh, is there anyone, if you have a question or a, or a comment, please just raise your hand. Yes, please go ahead. Turn this on. Hi, um, thanks, uh, my name is Blaine Haggard. I'm uh, from uh, Brock University in Canada, just down the road from, uh, from the Waterfront Toronto Sidewalk Labs project. Um, yeah, and so like, I, I was very interested to come to this panel and um, and hear about this. And uh, so just a few comments. Um, so sorry, no question at the end of it, but I'd be curious to see uh, uh, feedback from it on the waterfront Toronto thing. So uh, first of all, the uh, if if the uh, pro the uh, proposal on uh, data governance that I think the one you're talking about, it wasn't presented to the government of Ontario. It was presented to the tripartite government body. Um, uh, resp uh, that's responsible for running that part of the area. And um, the way that all this has come about has actually raised a lot of problems or a lot of issues around the question of data governance and who's setting these policies and what these policies are going to say. Um, you, we've been following this uh, since, the, uh, since the big splashy announcement uh, back uh, last November, so uh, about a year ago. And uh, over that time, um, it's been essentially uh, like, uh, like what, what is it, pulling teeth to actually get either uh, Sidewalk Labs or Waterfront Toronto to actually even discuss 
data as if it's um, as if it's something important to focus on. Everything else was kind of like the first part of the presentation, focusing on all the great things we can do with garbage cans, without focusing on who's going to own the data, who's going to control the data, how's the data going to be used, so on and so forth. Um, when the, we fi when they finally did put out a proposal, uh, I think it's important to note that it actually d it, that it came from Sidewalk Labs and not from Waterfront Toronto. In other words, you have a situation where essentially a vendor was a is attempting to set policy and there's, all, there's a few reasons for that. Um, and it also came in a situation, uh, a f it was presented a few days before the Digital Advisory Board for Waterfront Toronto, the government agency, was set to meet. They weren't involved in the, in the setting of this policy and uh, have raised a lot of questions about it. A guy named, I think, Sean McDonald has an article on Medium if people are interested about, uh, about the problems with, with it. Um, so there's the issues of the, uh, uh, it, so really is a governance issue, is whose role is it to set policy in this area? Is it the role of the vendor to do so? Um, cards on the table, I don't think so. Um, it, but the bigger issue uh, from a governance perspective is the fact that uh, uh, Waterfront Toronto as essentially the entity representing the public interest does not have the capacity to either develop policy in this area or really to um, to be frank, understand exactly what they're dealing with. Uh, and as a result, they've outsourced the setting of the policy to, uh, to sidewalk labs um, and also to, uh, to an advisory board. So this is a, this is a huge problem. So um, it's, it's a lot more clear and, and, the, uh, and the politics around it are a lot more complicated. We've had several resignations uh, from the board uh, over, over issues like that. Um, Finally, I'd also point out, too, that the other issue around this is the intellectual property as well, and this issue remains uh, unsettled, and there's no clarity as well on what Sidewalk Lab's business model is with respect to, uh, to this, uh, this project. And finally, I also note, too, in terms of bringing different groups around uh, into this process is that the consultations have been largely, uh, have been a little bit, uh, little bit problematic. Um, for instance, a, uh, a summer camp for, for children was passed off as part of the consultation process. And there hasn't, you know, for something like this, you'd expect maybe that there'd be some kind of online component, um, but there hasn't really been that. So a lot of problems with the governance, uh, still very unclear about what the, actu uh, what the actual process is, how it's working, and what the actual content of the policy is. So a lot of issues. Okay, thank you for your very detailed comments. And uh, I don't know, Nicholas, do you want to react directly or maybe we can take another comment or questions? If there is, a, there are, are there any other comments or questions in the room? Yes. Uh, do you have a, can you use the mic uh, close to your colleague there? I just have a very uh, uh, No, can, can you use the mic because we, we need it for the transcript, sorry. Uh, I just have a very little comment. Latin America, as you said, it's not only Mexico City, I'm from Mexico City. And the issue is not only the violence that uh, the city, uh, speaking only about Mexico, but Latin America in general, we don't have had the, um, we don't have had the money to invest in developing all these kind of technologies. Mexico, as example, is very expensive on all what its uh, phone calls. Up to last two, three years was the worst country up for the OCDE, as expensive as calling to, to abroad. So that's another major point that we have to highlight because it's not because of the goodwill of any kind of government uh, it's also the way how are you going to finance that that issue sure sure please go ahead thank you very much for your comment and and in developing economies and i can speak for latin america where argentina has 30 percent people under poverty all these projects about technology in a big city, they are not in the high priority agenda of the city. The city has many other problems, urgencies to, to, to deal with, so sometimes it's difficult to, in, in spite of the fact that this will enhance the, become better life for all the citizens, then it becomes complicated to put it in a, in a good um, agenda list and it, it's usually not, not the highest priority. Uh, so, to translate, this gentleman is saying that the capacity of the room is limited to the number of chairs. So every person that is that is standing up or sitting on the ground <laughs> must leave. 
I, re I apologize for this. I really apologize for this. Well, uh, so I really apologize for this. I really apologize for all those who are leaving. I'm sorry. It doesn't depend on us. Uh, okay. Uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, well, <laughs> never ending surprises at the UN. <laughs> Does anyone else that has a comfortable chair have a comment or a question? Well, okay, uh, please. Uh, Jessica, go ahead. Oh, we have yeah. a, com a, a comment on this from Jessica, and then you. you yeah, it's yeah. really quick. I'm sorry, folks, about this. You're sorry. Uh, well, just to say, like in Brazil, it's the it's very similar. We've been talking to municipalities, and they also mention, like, especially now they they're facing so many budget cuts, and they say like we have priorities, and we have like waste management and mobility, and so many issues. It's difficult to prioritize smart initiatives. Sometimes we need to like feed people and do waste management and do like many other 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 things so it's very very difficult for the cities to invest in technology sometimes so this creates like all these tensions with the the private sector and the civil society as well Just yeah. Yeah. all of the sessions are being live streamed um, so people who can't come to the session, they can look at it on the IGF uh, YouTube channel. They're all being live streamed. Thank you very much. It's a very, it's a very, it's a smart solution. <laughs> <laughs> Please, you had a comment. Yeah. Um, uh, hi, my name is Alvaro. I'm from Colombia. And I have a question, and is that you referred in your interventions to, uh, let's say, data mining of massive amounts of people, like envi for environmental issues and traffic. But can you give us an example of an individual data mining, like GPS tracking or something that is developing uh, right now, please? Do you mean an example of a service that uses this kind of data? Yeah, but uh, individually, not like for traffic that is a huge not, amount of people yeah not yeah. A, no, you mean not aggregate but uh, what do you mean personal data or, or or an example of personal data or an example of uh, ag data that is not aggregate but a, a single person that is spotted in the into the crowd oh well singular okay uh, do you want to, to I, I will have an example on this when I will or you can so for instance in an example that I will mention in Rio de Janeiro uh, the uh, uh, the platforms that provide individual transportation like Uber uh, or the is co its competitors uh, like Cabify or 99 Taxi they have to share data of each single uh, trip they uh, they organize with the the, the Rio de Janeiro uh, administration. Uh, so reports on this, and so this uh, also uh, includes uh, data on, I mean, per, may include personal data if they are not anonymized as efficiently as one could do. So this is uh, an example. If you need other uh, example, do you, do, do, you, do you want to chip in and provide? Well, I think maybe in Sao Paulo, the Bilhete Unico, yeah. the system that integrates all the mobility systems, all the public transit, the former mayor that now, was now elected governor of Sao Paulo, he offered all the data of the citizens to the private initiative for whoever wants to take them. This uh, caused such a controversy last year, I guess, last year? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think they backed up on this. But uh, he never mentioned if the data would be anonymized or anything, just like offer all the data from the public system in a city with more, more than 20, people 20 million people circulating daily. It's an example. OK, so uh, uh, okay. last comment from Yogi, and then we will have the second segment, where Yogi also. Yes. <coughs> yes, hi, my name is Yogi. I'm from Finland. And that's a very good question, these uh, individual services versus uh, services uh, for the masses. Uh, 
and uh, obviously there are differences in different cities uh, but what I'm seeing for example in Finland in in some other European cities there are more and more intention to move also uh, providing the city services individually for the citizens so it has been uh, traditionally that the city offers the well transportation for everybody there is the public transportation and they don't even ask who is jumping on the train or bus but now uh, there is more and more like there is in the private sector there is the uh, demand of more personalized services it, it applies to the cities as well and one example is uh, like uh, predicting what kind of needs citizens have. Very simple scenario is that uh, you have a child that is going to school whether the city is waiting for you to submit an application for the school place or whether the city is actually uh, prompting you that we know that you, your child is becoming in the age of going to school, here is uh, what we figured out that this would be a school place, is it uh, good for you? It could be even text message, yes or no. So that's how cities are thinking. It's not yet like the mainstream, but they are moving towards uh, trying to provide better services on individual basis. And of course that will bring the questions of data protection and privacy into the table much more than just uh, having trams and buses running on the streets okay uh, if we can we have uh, Robert on the can Robert can you hear us and can we is he's on, on the Webex platform as well so can he have uh, presentation rights so that he can also start with his presentation Robert can you hear us I'm just asking to be patient for one sec. Okay, it looks like Robert. Can you hear? Can you hear us? Do, is the Webex uh, connection working? We have your presentation, Robert, but we cannot hear you. Well, I suggest that while we figure out how to hear you guys, I, uh, maybe Yogi, would you, would you mind to be the, the first speaker of the second segment? Okay, why not? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, hello again, I'm Yogi from Finland. <laughs> uh, so, uh, I work for uh, the Aalto University in Finland, so I have research background. And I have, in, in my uh, given five minutes, I have uh, two goals. One is that uh, you get some idea what is my data as an organization. It's brand new uh, global nonprofit that was established one month ago. You can go to mydata.org and I can give you stickers and you can come to talk to me after I have this t-shirt and Raul has also one. So now you have the image, there is something new and uh, happy coming from Finland. Uh, so uh, then the other goal is that I hope that in the context of cities, nobody after this will ever again uh, say about ownership of data. That's controversial claim, but I come back to that. So anti-ownership and remember my data, those are my two goals. So uh, my data comes from the idea, as, as you can perhaps see from the uh, T-shirt, that individual is in the center. There are lots of data uh, around in the world. And uh, if we think of the traditional data protection uh, uh, thinking, for example, uh, there are laws that are put to the uh, uh, to the organizations that are managing the data. So they need to take care that they are not abusive for individuals, so that individuals can have privacy and other rights and. Uh, uh, liberties in, in the world of digital uh, data. So my data comes from that perspective that okay, uh, this um, data protection is one uh, axis on, on the uh, picture, but the other axis also uh, the utility of data. And uh, if we put this kind of uh, four quadrants, there are the really bad uh, 
big data giants that don't care about uh, privacy and data protection at all, but they are very good at using data. Just to put it uh, without any name dropping here, you know them. Then uh, there is this super strict uh, European GDPR regime that somebody p uh, even say that it will kill all the innovation from the Europe and we will be like uh, lagging behind because it's too strict. So that's protecting very carefully uh, the citizens. And we think that uh, uh, there is lots of good in personal data uh, that could be benefiting the individuals themselves. If a uh, city is collecting data about me, maybe that actually could be helpful for me. So it's not only bad thing that somebody collects data on me, but then uh, how to use that data it should be uh, uh, f with my uh, will so that it's actually benefiting me so that I could control uh, what that data is used for. So kind of getting the utility of data through individual control. That's the uh, basic idea of my data. Not saying that uh, data protection is uh, useless or bad, but kind of starting to climb up from that good security uh, to uh, climbing up the ladder so that the, I could get access to my data, uh, I could decide where to use it so that I could benefit from my data. That's the idea. And uh, yes, my data global is on. Uh, we have been running conferences for a couple of years in Helsinki, and uh, uh, we started to connect with people like Luca from Brazil, who have been thinking for a long time in the same uh, same way. And my data just gave the nice logo and brand for the thinking that's happening all over the world, and we are connecting there. Uh, now I think 27 local hubs in different cities, uh, including Toronto. So uh, the, I think uh, Sidewalk Labs is an important topic there. So uh, we got established as a non-profit uh, uh, one month ago. Uh, we have to m day after tomorrow in Barcelona first general meeting. So if you still want to join, you can be one of the founding members until 15th of November, then it's closed. <laughs> then you have a, a chance to be normal member but not any more founding members, so last chance. Anyways, that's my first point, my data, now you remember, everybody, okay, cool. So the second topic, uh, why I say that data ownership is not really the right paradigm of, uh, we have been uh, touching the uh, points of governance. Everybody is uh, screaming for getting better governance of data so that we could match the benefits uh, from data, making it uh, usable, uh, having the public interest represented, uh, but also uh, protecting the privacy and security, etc. So that's a governance problem. And uh, one problem inside the governance problem is that people are shouting that uh, there should be clear ownership of data. And that's plainly wrong. Uh, and, and there are reasons for that because data, uh, it's called uh, non-rival uh, assets. So basically, if I have a data, if I know something, it doesn't uh, uh, say that Luca could not know the same thing. So it's uh, Albert Einstein said that uh, if, if I know something, uh, if I have 10 pennies and I give you 10 pennies, I'm 10 pennies more poor. But if I know something and if I tell that to you, you know it also, you are one more knowledge bit richer, but I still have my knowledge. So that's the basic idea. Data and knowledge, it's not a uh, rival uh, thing. And ownership, on the other hand, that's a paradigm that ex explicitly says that it's exclusive. Either I know I own it or you own it. There are some uh, models of uh, shared ownership. Uh, that's different thing, but let's uh, stick to the basics. So ownership says that it's exclusive. And I give an example from personal data uh, uh, view. Maybe there is a city of Helsinki uh, that uh, collects uh, data on me that is uh, done by uh, systems that are implemented by, let's say, Google or IBM or somebody else. So then there are three parties. Who should own that data? The ones who provide uh, uh, infrastructure, the city or me? No one. That's the thing. Ownership is not the way to start even the discussion because it only gives the barriers. The question, real question is that who should have rights 
uh, to learn about the data when we go to the AI thinking. Who, uh, and it doesn't say that uh, if I can learn about my data that city of Helsinki collected, Helsinki could not learn about that. So th that's the thing. Maybe uh, the infrastructure vendor has some legitimate rights to uh, learn about. If they are developing their algorithms, why not if it's not uh, causing uh, harm for, for the people or the city? So it's not exclusive. And uh, the thing, uh, we need to uh, forget about the ownership speaking because that's just locking our minds. And in, in my data, we are uh, very much interested in uh, developing the, uh, for example, this Barcelona uh, um, data trust uh, thing is interesting in, in, uh, in Helsinki and Lyon. There are examples of uh, uh, cities uh, uh, starting to provide uh, these my data wallets or something like that for the citizens that they could collect. Uh, and control their data. So that's infrastructure question. Just let's forget about the ownership. That's my end of uh, speech. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much, Yogi, for being always very inspiring and clear. Uh, now, uh, can we have finally Robert and Phil? Uh, well, I'm, I'm, I also asked somebody in, in the room. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, so we, can we have them? Yeah. Okay. Well, let's do. Uh, well, I, otherwise, uh, sorry, I, ca I can go ahead. I will try to be brief so that then we can have uh, uh, time for Robert and Phil uh, and for comments. So, the actually, my my what I want to say is very well connected with what uh, Yogi was saying and also what the previous presentation were saying, uh, which is basically the fact that we, uh, first of all, when we speak about smart cities, we have to come to understand that it's a very elastic concept and a lot of things are labeled as, as smart cities. And uh, to my students, I used to say that when there is something, uh, when there, we use the, the word smart, it may also entail that there is some dumb somewhere else. So it's always good to be a little bit curious, at least, and to try to question what has been labeled as uh, smart things uh, or smart cities. Uh, so what, when we speak about smart cities, we generally assume that there is an increase in efficiency that is driven by the collection processing of data. And in any kind, it could be personal data, or anonymized data, or regular data, for instance, on sewage or trash which do not really encompass personal data. Uh, they may, uh, they may, be, may be aggregate uh, in big data analytics and you don't even know what you are looking for and you will discover it, or they may be targeted for specific uh, purposes, for specific objective, for instance, to reduce traffic, uh, to uh, enhance the quality of, of, of the air, or to reduce uh, problems with sewage. Actually, sewage and water management is one of the key priority, both of the habitat agenda and, uh, well, identified by the, by the UN of, of, as one of the key priority, also particularly for Latin America. Uh, the uh, analysis that we have been conducting uh, with regard to Brazil, and especially Rio, Sao Paulo, and Curitiba, uh, shows that uh, many things, many initiatives that are branded as, as smart cities they usually encompass the collection and use of data, uh, but maybe sometimes are not so smart, and maybe sometimes are, uh, although Brazil comes from a very democratic uh, par participatory tradition in terms of city management, Brazil has been the pioneering, for instance, participatory budgeting, where the budget of the city, at least part of it, is discussed participatory since the early 2000s, and that is, is, has been one of the first countries in this, uh, but uh, that is lacking with regard to smart cities. Uh, so it, although one would expect in Brazilian cities to have this kind of new, potentially very beneficial services being implemented as a result of public consultations, those public consultations are, are usually lacking. And uh, in the case of Rio, which has been over the past 10 years considered one of the most, one of the smartest city in the world, uh, because it, it started to do extensive and intensive use of data collection for uh, services, uh, there has no, not been any uh, consultation at all. Actually, the, the, the smart cities services were implemented out of need, 
primarily due to the mega events organized, uh, the John Paul II, the Pope coming to Rio, and two years uh, or five, five years later, the FIFA World Cup, uh, the, win the, the Olympics only two years ago. So uh, the city of Rio had to manage an extreme vi variety, not only of data, of people in the most efficient way. Uh, a, a colleague of us uh, at FGV was the person that designed the Rio, uh, the Rio uh, war room for data, the data control management uh, uh, service and, and capabilities of, 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 of uh, uh, the Rio uh, administration. But uh, they, what they had in mind were, was efficiency, was not data protection, data control. I like the, I like the, the, the my data philo philosophy of not being the owner, but being the one that controls data. I, I, I actually, I've, I also published one year ago, a, a, and it was like that, I, I met Robert and Phil, uh, I, I participated to this work from the World Health Organization, the Health Technology Journal. They, we, we, there, there was this collection directed by Robert on uh, privacy and, 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 and uh, the challenges with regard to medical data. And what I, I've written in this, uh, in, this my, in my chapter is precisely that you, you don't, we don't, we don't, we have to move from the paradigm of uh, data protection and go to the paradigm of data control, because it's too fuzzy to speak about privacy and data protection. And we, data protection usually encompasses a binary choice: either you give your data, and or you do not give them. So you protect them if you don't give them. Uh, if, you do, if you give them, you lose protection. That is not, that is not, uh, is not a, a, a sustainable choice. What is sustainable is to have different nuances. I can give my data to, for this purpose. I can give my data to these actors. I have to have choice, and that is precisely what my data uh, is trying also to implement. Uh, to, coming back to the, the example of Rio de Janeiro, I wanted to illustrate this very briefly. Uh, with a decree, a decree that has been adopted by the current administration only uh, four months ago, on how to regulate uh, uh, the private transportation intermediated via apps, so for to Uber and its competitors. Uh, as Olga was mentioning, traffic is one of the main problems in Latin American cities. Uh, I was mentioning before to the gentleman that asked the question that uh, this really illustrates to me uh, the mentality of doing something that is supposed to be smart, uh, but without having data protection as a priority. Uh, the, so the administration adopted this, government, this decree in, on, on April, uh, and uh, according to which all those companies that are providing private transportation intermediated via apps, uh, they have to share periodically reports on uh, all the trips that have been uh, initiated, terminated or not, with the, all the destination uh, and data about everything, basically with the administration that can generally use them to implement policies, which for, for in terms of, uh, of, of uh, uh, objective, of purpose of the uh, processing is already quite fuzzy. Uh, although the, the, the decree states that the data have to be managed respecting privacy of users, there is absolutely no obligation to request consent or to inform of what of the purposes the users uh, uh, whose data are utilized. So uh, those that are pillars of data protection are not mentioned by this decree. Uh, and although there is a, uh, a general data protection legislation that is, has just been adopted in Brazil, it will enter into force in only in two years. So we can assume that right now the uh, personal data of individuals are collected, shared with the administration, processed, but there is no duty to communicate how they are processed and to request consent for further uh, utilization. And the cherry on top is that there is no security obligation. So if that, those data are collected, processed and shared with the administration, then there is no security obligation and there is no sanction in case of those in existing obligations are not respected. So this is just to illustrate that, of course, the, the, the processing of data may have a lot of benefits to, for the for the citizen of Rio de Janeiro, the Carioca may have much more efficient traffic, but may, it may also entail a lot of risks. And not considering at all those risks, it's 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 a fault. It's really a fault. Uh, so uh, two, I, the, the two messages they wanted to, to communicate are the need 
for consultation, the, an informed consultation, and also the gentleman from Toronto was, was stressing that this is a very uh, fundamental pillar of uh, smart cities, and also the need to communicate how data are utilized and allow citizens to choose how they want their data to be utilized. I see some noise. Do we have... Yes, sure we can try. We, <laughs> yes, please try. <laughs> Excellent. Can you hear us, Robert? Robert, or can you say something? Robert or Phil, if you say, if you can hear us, uh, say something so that we know if you are communicating with us. Well, uh, yes, it's him. JPN is him. Yeah. Is waving hand. Phil is waving his hand, and do we have the possibility to have him speaking? <laughs> well, okay. Uh, I'm uh, well. We unfortunately, due to technical problems, we will not be able to have remote presentations. Uh, I, I well, you, you can start. You can keep on try uh, while we take. Comp Okay, we have to reboot the computer. So uh, if you want, we can reboot the computer while we take comments because I'm sure that the people here, yes, please go ahead. There and there, yes. Hi, my name is Catherine Tai. I'm from SAIP. And then um, thank you, uh, all the panelists, for great uh, presentations. I've learned a lot about smart cities. My husband also uh, did a lot of smart city research and work on it uh, at the World Bank for a while. So I know just a little bit. Uh, so my question, it, please excuse my ignorance because I'm definitely no expert <laughs> on this topic. So my question is about on democratic countries when they are uh, implementing a smart city uh, plan or they are trying to export smart city plans in also other undemocratic countries. What should we talk about? Um, what are the right questions for us to ask um, in terms of data governance? Because you talk a lot about uh, data ownership, right? So you say that's not the right question to ask. Then, then what are the right questions for, for us to ask? Uh, can I just provide an immediate reaction, and then, gentlemen, there can. So the thing I think what something that we should uh, understand is that there are some very good practices, like the city of Barcelona. Where uh, and they are they are really I think they are the best example of smart city in the world uh, because they are not only trying to use uh, all data possible to uh, provide efficient services but also to use them in a sustainable way, meaning that uh, as Nicholas was saying the ch there is a chief data uh, a chief technology officer that is orchestrating all this data are not uh, th th what is very important is that they are not data are not. Uh, uh, given for free to uh, other corporations that then store them in a silos. They are managed by the city and then others can have access. So it's th 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 there is a sort of uh, a, a trustee, a fiduciary that ma manages data and then others can have access. And that is the, bo the best model. Unfortunately, as you point out, that is, a, a, is not the rule. It's not the general rule. It's an exception. That is the reason why we consider it the best practice, because it is exceptional. Uh, very frequently, uh, administrations, either because they do not have the financial capability, as Olga also was saying, and also the lady that had to, to go away uh, was saying, uh, either they don't have the, the financial cap uh, capability, or it is simply not a priority, or they simply do not know how to do it. And so they are easily seduced by a corporation saying, well, you know what, we can make this very efficient and smart uh, if we can collect all data and then uh, provide the service. And that doesn't always come with the possibility for people to keep on using data. It may come with the possibility on, on, only of extracting data and then shaping how data are used based on the corporation's policy without uh, consulting the local stakeholders. And that is something I think we should try to avoid if we want to, to keep uh, smart cities sustainable cities. Uh, so the, the thing is that the, both models are possible. The, the model in which uh, people and citizens have retained control of their data and the model where they simply become data producers and other uh, entities okay. utilize, their, utilize, utilize their data. Uh, I th the, the first one is of course, the, 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 I, in my opinion, the model to which we should uh, strive 
to, 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 that we should try to, to achieve. The other one, unfortunately, is the general rule, but uh, I think this happens for the lack, for, because this kind of conversation are lacking. Please, go ahead. Uh, no, I, I, there was a gentleman that is waiting since uh, 20 minutes. No, I think you haven't finished your explanation. To No, if, if you haven't finished, you just finish it. Okay. Uh, no, I was wondering, what is, uh, because I have some uh, several questions for the, maybe the basic. Uh, when you say upon data, is it about the data process, uh, is it included data processing or only data collection? When you, test. Yes. When uh, when we call when we talk about open data, is it about the data uh, processing as well, or only about data collection? Data collection, and then how do you see portability? Portability uh, about the use of personal data. Do you think it's actually it's uh, answer a bit about how we can use the personal data, for example, in uh, open data, as uh, rather than become uh, barriers for innovation? It is actually helping people to do innovation. So, and then. I think the concept of data ownership and so on. I think it's a, uh, it's a. Uh, because it started that people start to think that data is extended of our body, ex our uh, body, so it will lead to our reputation if people uh, knows uh, certain of the type of information about us. So does it mean that uh, from the comments that have been made here, does it mean that we need to reduce our privacy as the technology is uh, increasing, we increasing relying on technology in order for us to survive. And also, I was wondering about the ethics. How do you see the ethics uh, will uh, adding more to the regulation or is it more like will be a battle between ethics and regulation? And we also need to look that uh, it's the same like how the law it's uh, works in everywhere. I think it's the how we implement the e-government including open data here. It can be uh, different in different part of the world because sometimes it's also culture makes the law itself. So how do you see the standard? Because uh, there is like some people said about the democracy country in democracy country and I think you will also uh, maybe give the how the open data should be implemented uh, maybe from the policy and legal framework and then uh, do you see that because open data and in smart city as a part of the implementation of uh, smart open data is uh, implementation of the smart city uh, do you think that the needs I, for I, the citizens? I, I think we, we, we had a lot of, a lot of okay, questions. Okay. So, so I will make so it uh, one just second. Just to make to be uh, sure okay. that we reply to all questions. Uh, okay. Do you have a final yeah, comment? Final. Yes. Okay, just okay. three words. So do you think it's a... Uh, the citizen needs to get a referendum or get a consensus in a public on how open data should be uh, applied? Thank you. I see Yogi has an initial comment and then I... Yeah, I try to answer some of these questions. Uh, so first for you, asking uh, what are the questions what we should be asking if we are not asking who owns the data. So... Uh, Especially in like undemocratic countries. Sorry? Especially undemocratic Undemocratic. Countries. Yeah, like when they're implementing smart city plans and, and they're promoting the smart city uh, model overseas, also in undemocratic yeah. countries, then what are the right questions for us to ask? So the, so the key words, undemocratic countries. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, I think uh, if, if there is undemocratic country, it has some challenges in this domain that are different. Uh, uh, but the principles uh, were to aim. Uh, I think uh, uh, even undemocratic, undemocratic countries uh, and cities uh, probably do the stuff for the best of the uh, community. It might not end up like that, but basically uh, I doubt that uh, anybody really wants to kill the citizens or do the bad mm -hmm. thing. And, and uh, there I think w what is in undemocratic uh, uh, governance, uh, the strongholder is the government or the city government. So they tend to think that, okay, we own the data, we can do whatever about it because we know the best, how to use it best for the society. And in, uh, in some other place, it might be that the uh, private company thinks that uh, they know the best uh, how to use it 
And in, in some democratic uh, countries, like, ah, nobody knows, we just need to make the referendum and figure out the rules. But uh, basically, it's still the governance problem, what to do, uh, how to get the data best to support uh, uh, the society. That's the basic question. And uh, there, still, the ownership uh, is not the best way, because it limits the, uh, who can actually make good stuff of, of the uh, data. So basically, uh, it, uh, undemocratic uh, governance uh, governances can also uh, uh, open the data to be used by, uh, by their own citizens and uh, make open data when there is no privacy limitations. That would be my, my uh, guidance, but uh, I mean, it's probably difficult. Then for, for you, I just wanted to comment that um, Definitely this question is about uh, processing the data. Collection is becoming less and less and less important in these debates because data is just being collected so much, uh, the focus is moving to where it is used and whether that use is ethical and uh, acceptable. So more focus on the uh, uh, actually using of the data than collecting. And the GDPR Article 20, everybody should know that that's bright, ni nice article that uh, people can have access to their own data in digital format. It's in the law, probably it doesn't uh, change too much unless we build good technology to support it. And, and Raul is one of the masterminds to, uh, he's, he's running a course, a MOOC course, to educate people to use that new right that come from that. I would also highlight Article 6 in the regulation on the free flow of, of non-personal data, which, you know, authorizes the creation of, of codes of conduct around portability of data. And I think that's one interesting way to think about putting the individual in control of, of their own data is by giving them the authority to um, switch providers uh, if, if they are frustrated or dissatisfied with whatever current hosted data they're using, they can easily switch to another provider without any, any restrictions on, on, on that. Um, and that's interesting when Luca mentioned about the Uber thing. That's uh, now the platforms, they are uh, trying to restrict as much as possible uh, people changing from one, one platform to another. And that comes uh, really problematic if a city, for example, decides that, okay, uh, let's buy these services from somebody and uh, uh, then city kind of uh, forcefully locks people into using one platform if there is no uh, fluidity for uh, people to change. Actually, in this case, the problem that yeah, the lady there was mentioning actually becomes double because you have potentially undemocratic country exploiting the same surveillance capabilities that also the corporation is, is exploiting. So it it's increases the problem. I mean, it is efficient surveillance. It's not efficient management of the city. I see there are one. Uh, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. I didn't, uh, I didn't see. So there were other questions as well. Okay. You were first or? Okay, so go ahead and then we take the four comments. Okay. Um, my name is Ru Ratzenk. Is it working? Yes, yeah, yes. I work for the city uh, of Amsterdam, um, and we do a lot on, on data privacy. I mean, we have open data projects, open source projects. It's like in our official policies that we should protect data. We don't allow Wi-Fi tracking, etc. So, you know, there's a lot that we're doing. But there's only so much we can do as a smart city, like, you know, like the example of Barcelona as well. While, of course, big uh, corporates, they own, like, I don't know how much percent, let's say 90% of all of all data that's relevant. So my question also to, to uh, Yogi uh, is like, of course, whether it's in an undemocratic co country or whether you're facing big corporates, in either case, the access from the individual to the data or the public data, that would be the solution. And even in the GDPR, it says we are allowed to access our data, right? And even to remove the data. So we already have this right. But my question is how can we start to implement this? How can we start to demand this? Uh, yeah, how to do it? Sorry, can, uh, before we take the other comments, we can just provide a quick com comment on this. So uh, I, I, in GDPR or in other uh, regulatory framework, the right to access means that you have the right to know what a corporation or an, a, a data controller, an entity that is collecting your data, what, what data does he have. With the portability, you have the right uh, to, to, to download your data, but uh, that, that doesn't mean that you, it's still binary. It's still binary. It's still, I, you can know it or not. You can download it or not, but you cannot 
to ask the corporation to use them according to your will. And you cannot, and even when you download it, maybe the format you download it is useless because it's, it, I, for instance, if you want to download your Facebook data, you will download the data in text, which is useless, literally useless to use it in another service. So it's, yes, you have downloaded a lot of data, but you cannot use them. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's, it's a matter also not only of, uh, of portability, it's also a matter of, in, of interoperable formats that allow you to exploit your data. And the right to access is very good, but is that only allow you to know what kind of data someone has on you, not to decide how to use, that you can use them. I'll just, I'll just say on that point, uh, at Google, we've had a long-term project called Google Takeout. Takeout allows you to download a copy of your data, but we realized this problem was arising where you can't take the data in easily to another competing platform. Exactly. So we have a new project called the Data Transfer Project exactly. that is designed to sort of uh, remove those obstacles and make it simple to transfer to a, different, a competing provider. I, uh, Yogi, do you want to have a co quick comment and then we, ha we have the gentleman there and uh, Helga here and the lady there. Yeah, quick comment uh, on that. Yes, the data portability clause, it's in the law, it's not in the software yet, that's the problem. It will be there and us as the uh, people caring about the governance, uh, there is a looming risk that even if I say that it's really good that people can have uh, the, uh, their data uh, for hopefully in usable format in the in the future there is also the caveat that maybe if if nothing changes in the uh, dominant business models it just will mean that the yes i agree to the terms of service problem is will be exploding so basically like for example the data transfer project it's uh, between google twitter uh, facebook uh, amazon and microsoft so uh, now, uh, the motivation for me to take out something uh, from Google, it's uh, low because there is nothing where I can put it. Okay, now there is the data transfer project that says that, okay, if you take something out of these sum five, you can put it up in, in basically it works automatically. So you can give uh, permission to, uh, to uh, copy data over. So easily you can imagine uh, this ending up that if uh, Google knew about my data this much and Facebook knew about this much and Amazon knows about this much, after this project everybody knows this much because they all cross uh, and, and this is just like our data is spreading everywhere and that's not really a control either. So it, it's very one-sided control and uh, we need to develop uh, kind of meaningful ways of uh, uh, tying more the control to the actual use of data. This is still the control of collecting and sharing, but what is really interesting is how and where and why the data is used, and that's where we need individual control. Although I would argue that's where the right to deletion comes in. After you transfer your data out, you can then delete it from the, the original service and then there would be less of it. But I also would argue that that, that is still binary. Sure. Either yeah. you erase data yeah. or you let the, or someone using data. So yeah. it's yeah. not really a, a yet control on your data. I, there was a gentleman there that is kindly waiting since 10 minutes and then here and here. Can you use the mic, please? Sorry. Thank you. Thank you, Rika. I'm Ali from Morocco. I have a stupid question and I would like to get a smart answer, please. Uh, you talk about public uh, consultations. H how is it about? Is it about online consultation or face-to-face -face consultation with um, well-chosen uh, NGOs, etc. I would like to get your feedback from that. Thanks. Uh, well, we need to have in mind, for example, that in Brazil, only around 52% of households have internet access, so connectivity is still an issue, like a huge issue in Brazil. Uh, so it cannot rely uh, only and solely in uh, online public consultations. We need like the face-to-face, -face and especially in smaller or medium-sized towns and cities, we need to go there and consult people in local and like talk to them and listen to their needs. Uh, public consultation done online are a good mechanism and a good tool for sure uh, but we need like to do this and engage people uh, in policy making uh, locally as well uh, I'd say offline for example even if you are talking about smart cities I'd say for like grassroots and uh, social participation we need to foster uh, participation in all means we can I'd, I'd say this as well. 
I'll say too, for the sidewalk project in Toronto, we've run uh, three um, public consultations. They're actually on YouTube if you want to watch them. They're pretty fascinating documents, I think, of, of, of hearing concerns and, and, and grievances from the community and trying to, to incorporate our response to those into our proposal. So I think they're worth a watch. Also, another, just another point. I think what is key, uh, not to, again, not to, uh, to just to have the label consultation, then check it, and you are and you have the consultation. It depends also <laughs> which kind of consultation. I mean, what is, for instance, key is to provide uh, objective information of what on what are the the costs and benefits of the service you want, the smart city service you want to implement. So, for instance, that what would be very good is this consultation having academics, uh, people that are already studying. The, 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 the issue explaining, introducing the topics before the consultation, uh, highlighting ob <laughs> as objectively as possible what could be the cost, how the service would work, and what could be the costs and benefits, so that that is an informed consultation. Is because, I mean, you can ask, re you can request the feedback of people that don't know nothing about what, they, uh, what you're going to do, and they will not be able to express their will uh, freely because they, they, are, they are biased. They don't know what are the risks or what are the benefits. So it's very important to, to provide objective material ahead. Uh, the lady there and then help. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Prita, I'm from Indonesia. Uh, I have a little bit of background of urban planning, so I'm really concerned about the smart cities and dumb cities as well. So I, I want to add a quick comment for the question about the right question to ask about open data and smart cities, especially in democratic countries. I think there's also a question about uh, what are the priorities and how open uh, should it open data be? Because with all the buzzing words about smart cities, there's also a tendency of uh, seeing ICT and data as a main end, not as a tool to achieve like uh, provide uh, efficient public services, some things like that, because there would be uh, like uh, there would be uh, another good thing if like we have an advanced uh, data collection, data, proce data processing, and good data governance, but at the same time excluding the citizens uh, that have a digital gap or even doesn't know how to use the open data like that. Thank you. I'm Helga Mühling. I'm from the Austrian Ministry of Transport, Innovation and Technology. And from my point of view, we are not only talking about democracy or perhaps about data protection and so on, but our focus would be public benefit, public service, public good. And this should be based on a human right-based uh, approach. A human right-based approach is essential for us. And, uh, something that has been agreed on European level as well, and uh, also on rule of law. Human rights and rule of law are essential. Thanks. I think that was probably the best way to uh, close our panel. Uh, if, do, do panelists have any further remarks to wrap up? Please, Yogi, go ahead. Yeah, just very quickly to these last two comments, uh, which reflect the same, like looking uh, the smart city development from the end goals, not from the, yes, we have the ICT, yes, we have the data. Yes. And uh, from my data perspective, it would be kind of human-centric uh, city development, asking like, okay, what kind of needs, what kind of life events uh, this person uh, has and then starting to, uh, taking that as a starting point, I think the consultancy questions comes also f much more naturally. I think the whole smart uh, city, uh, uh, I think uh, the label was given by some tech companies coming to sell uh, infrastructure and solutions and these war centers to Rio. Mm -hmm. And that's coming, uh, coming from like very much organizational uh, perspective. If you change the perspective to human-centric, you are probably not speaking about smart cities. You are just speaking about cities normally. So human-centric, that's it. Okay, excellent. Uh, so uh, I would like to thank you for the very interesting comments and feedback. To uh, apologize again for the for those who have been kicked out by the UN guards because they could not stand up. So uh, thank you very much. And uh, well, I hope we will have time to interact and exchange more on these topics. Thank you.